Welcome to this year's Sadfo Award ceremony. And a special welcome to Roger Scruton, the, the, the recipient of this year's award. We are very happy and proud to welcome you here today in the Free Press Society. And we have been very much been looking forward to this day. The award, the Sappho Award, is given to a person that has shown fearlessness in uncompromising writing. And Roger Scruton definitely fits to this description. But I should leave the, motiva the motivation to Professor Nikolai Foss. And before I do this, I will just say a few words about this afternoon. As you can see in the program, we start out with a motivation from Professor at Copenhagen Business School, Prof uh, Nicolai Foss. And after that, Roger Schulten will have, uh, give a speech on free speech and political correctness. And then in the end, there will be time for Q's and A's to Roger Schulten. And then I should have said now, at this point, that it, it's possible <coughs> to buy the only of Roger Schulten's many, many books that is actually translated into Danish. The Need for Nations, the Shona and the but it's not. I can't. <coughs> it's it's sold out there, but it's already sold out, so it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what what a success is like. So I will leave the floor to you, right. Nicola. Thank you, Katrine. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm delighted and honored to introduce to you, to you today someone whose work I've admired for a long time and who has influenced my own thinking profoundly and perhaps even my behavior, I suppose, namely Professor Roger Scruton. A visit by Professor Scruton has been long overdue. And I think we should all be immensely grateful to Katrine Winkelhorn for, uh, for making this happen. As most of you will know, Professor Scruton's visit was originally planned for a date in March. Uh, a horse riding accident intervened, which is certainly a very worthy excuse for cancelling for a conservative philosopher who endorses traditional ways of, of life. Apropos horses, Scruton apparently, and this may be a myth, perhaps you can tell us, uh, Scruton apparently started horseback riding because Enoch Powell told him that any true conservative must engage in fox hunting. <laughs> and to do that, you evidently, you, you need to be able, capable of riding a horse. And besides, there are few things that upset socialists more than, than fox hunting, so. <laughs> in fact, uh, Powell sold Scruton his hunting gear, and the story goes that when someone asked Powell about the hunting clothes, he said, we're just about the same size. Physically, I mean, not intellectually. <laughs> And the, the background to this, of course, is that Inna Paul became a full professor, like, like Nietzsche, by the way, uh, in his mid-twenties, which was then and still is remarkable. And it does things to your ego, of course. <laughs> now, anecdotes aside, there are at least two mm, closely related reasons why we should cheer about having Professor Scruton with us today. First of all, Professor Scruton is a, a true public intellectual of great international standing. Now part of the world, he is no doubt the person who has done most to articulate and you may even say restore intellectual conservatism in the tradition from Edmund Burke. And behind this feed is a production of books, pamphlets, magazine and newspaper articles, essays, appearances as a public speaker in settings such as this, but also on BBC TV and BBC radio, that is simply breathtaking. The productivity is amazing. And Professor Scruton is very much a public philosopher, somewhat perhaps in the tradition of Bertrand Russell or Alfred Ayer. And he has distinguished himself in the wider public by, among other things, defending fox hunting and by mercilessly attacking the oceans of postmodernist nonsense that has that have been pouring out of the universities of France and the United States. Non nonsense that is not just nonsense because it is invading our universities and is in increasingly invading our public discourse, influencing politics 
And it's doing this because I think it, it meets the always manifest need for substitute religions. Now that traditional Marxism is, is dead. Now the second reason why we should share about this visit, um, which is, of course, this is the, what is directly related to uh, the Safa Award, is that Professor Scruton is a stalwart for freedom of speech. I think this partly reflects what seems to be a penchant for cleverly formulated, often hilarious, in fact, controversial statements. Um, um, a journalist recently said, tongue-in-cheek, that Professor Scruton is a right-wing <coughs> polemicist who has been accused over the years of everything from racism to homophobia to probably global warming. <laughs> He has, at any rate, consistently stood up for the right to free speech, for example, by defending uh, the Nobel Prize winner, medicine, Tim Hunt, when he was recently hounded for making lame, but fundamentally uh, harmless, innocent remarks about how cumbersome it can be as a man when you fall in love in science with the girls in the lab, and things may end up, God knows where, in marriage, for example. I'm myself mar married to a colleague, so I can relate to so Tim's remarks in this regard, and I hope I won't be, be hounded for this remark. <laughs> now, Scruton himself was, if, if not hounded, then he certainly got in bad standing with the politically correct set, when in 1984, as the editor of the Salisbury Review, he published a short article by a headmaster in Bradford, Roy Honeyford. And if you read the piece, you'll see it's a, it's a quiet, um, fundamentally, I'd say, constructive warning against some of the concrete excesses of multiculturalism in, the British, in parts of the British school system. But Honeyford was, this caused a stir, Honeyford was removed as a headmaster. The left side of the political spectrum, including I surmise a substantial part of Professor Scruton's colleagues, decided that his level of evil was <coughs> at the level of Enoch Powell's and perhaps worse actually. And his academic career, he says, was then basically basically over. And for the last two decades, perhaps more, he's been fundamentally an independent scholar, writer, part-time farmer. Uh, so you, you may say that he has certainly himself paid uh, the price or the cost of freedom of speech that you may have to bear if you are an articulate, conservative, public intellectual in a politically correct and left-wing climate. So Scruton himself offers a, uh, quite a principled defense of, of, of this free freedom in various parts of his work. Uh, and such defenses of freedoms of speech, of speech are, of course, of the utmost importance, given the now constant assaults that are, now be that are being made on this freedom. These assaults are not isolated incidents. They grow from an ideology. And attacking freedom of speech has become an industry driven by social justice warrior, by parts of feminism, and by what we may call offense entrepreneurs. People who delight in taking offense and delight in the attention that the very public taking offense brings them. So it's an industry, and it's an industry that's becoming institutionalized as people benefit, as there's something in it for them, not just attention, but also often jobs and money. So in US, for example, US universities, there are bias response teams that will check up on politically incorrect speech, whether made by faculty or <coughs> by students. To give another example, we now have a climate where a Scot Scottish man, I read in The Guardian of all places yesterday, mm. where a Scottish man who has apparently taught his dog to make the Nazi salute, uh, faces hate crime charges. <laughs> now the, the only proper response to such foolishness, which, is, which it is, sheer foolishness, is to shrug your shoulder and move on and let the dog do the Nazi salute, for God's sake. <laughs> but the offense industry thinks otherwise. A part of the uh, principal defense of free speech is that as a free society, we should not only tolerate extreme opinions, we actually, literally, need extreme opinions to probe the boundaries of our knowledge and push forward. And therefore it will not do 
if, for example, right wings, right wing opinions are deliberately suppressed in certain parts of our academia, as research has conclusively, conclusively shown is the case. This is not to say that we should necessarily cultivate verbal aggressiveness and that something is worthwhile saying just because it is extreme. That's not the case, of course. And most of the time, we literally should just shrug our shoulders and go on with our lives. But the point is that useful extreme opinions cannot be made and cannot thrive in a climate where all pur purportedly extreme opinions, at least on one side, of the political spectrum are haunted. Well, I'm sure Professor Schroeden can address these issues in a much more profound and eloquent manner than I'm capable of, so I'm most happy, I'm pleased to pass the word to today's recipient of the Sappho Award. Thank you. Thanks to my wife, just for the time being. <laughs> it's probably the only time she's going to get flowers from me. <coughs> um, I'm very sorry that I've uh, lost my voice, um, so I, I may not be very clear to, to hear, but I, I hope you can understand. Anyway, uh, first, let me say how honoured I am to receive this award, and um, I, I, I'm how grateful I am for those very kind words of Professor Foss which um, actually seemed to me to have said everything that has to be said, in a way, about free speech, that we're um, under pressure from what is in effect uh, an industry of, um, of offence, uh, which is trying not just to silence people like, um, like me, uh, but also to claim territory for itself uh, at, at the expense of others. And I think this is one of the important issues that we need to understand. So let me uh, start from the beginning by asking just what what is free speech? Uh, what is it exactly? Well, it is obviously a right. It's the right to say what you wish to say, regardless of various things. But regardless of what? And is it a legal right or a moral right? Uh, and this is a, already a question that to many of us find difficult to answer. Uh, it should be a, a surely a, a, a legal right, but it doesn't follow that it's a moral right. There are many things which, are, which we have a legal right to do, which we have moral, no moral right to do. I have a legal right uh, to speak angrily uh, to, to, to you in this room, but it's not a moral right. I don't want to offend you, and I shouldn't want to offend you. Other actions which people judge to be wrong morally, like, say, adultery, nevertheless, there's a legal right to, to commit them for the, because we think that the law should not extend to, into this private realm uh, uh, in order to confiscate the real moral arguments. But um, <clears throat> in the case of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of free speech, we do seem to think that without a legal right that is protected by the law, uh, there's nothing that there's no point that we have really established. We really have to have that legal right if there is to be public discussion about the issues that matter. Uh, in some areas, we can protect our right to free speech through civil action. We, we can uh, bring a case against those who are trying to shut us up. Uh, but in many cases, that doesn't seem to be sufficient. If those who are trying to shut us up are, are anonymous and uh, multitudinous, then it is very difficult to defend ourselves by civil action. So clearly, we ought to have some other means of defense available to us. And that's what um, thinkers down the, since at least the 19th century have have uh, wished that we should have some kind of legal protection for, for things said honestly and openly in, in the cause of public discussion. Uh, John Stuart Mill famously said that, uh, that the attempt to silence speech 
is to deprive not only the person who is um, making, who is uttering something, but also the person who is attempting to silence him of the uh, of the truth of the matter under consideration. Scientific advance depends upon exposing our beliefs to refutation and if we try and protect those beliefs from refutation through the law uh, then we effectively bring the pursuit of truth to an end. Um, but the question is though what, what exactly does the assault on free speech amount to? In, in the modern world the world that we share now, there are many ways in which people can be intimidated which were not available to our ancestors. For example, not, not just shouting people down in a, in a lecture hall, but engineering a Twitter storm, you know, because somebody has said something. Is that not a way of, of intimidating, punishing the, someone for a remark uh, in a way that he, that we, against which we have no defence? Increasingly, we're actually seeing this uh, being used as the way of, uh, of uh, uh, punishing unorthodox opinions and creating an atmosphere of fear. You know, if, you, if you utter the wrong word, it gets around on the, on the internet or, or through, these, uh, through um, Facebook or, or, or Twitter or whatever. <coughs> it, the case, Professor Foss already mentioned the case of Sir Tim, Sir Tim Hunt who said at a conference in an out-of-the-way place, South Korea, um, a few, it was a scientific conference, that um, it is difficult for men and women to share a laboratory because you tend to fall in love with the women and when you speak to them crossly, they tend to cry. Now, that's not a very sensible thing to say in public, um, but immediately there was a Twitter storm uh, uh, activated uh, and um, you, you might say, well, uh, so what? I, you know, I'm not on Twitter, so does, what does it, why does it matter to me? But it does matter because, of course, the, it, the, it then becomes a, public con, a matter of public concern. In the end, Sir Tim was um, rep, reprimanded uh, publicly by the Royal Society, of which he's a fellow, um, and um, also had to step down from his job uh, in the University of London and, uh, as, as a professor. And his wife, too, had to do something, uh, had to, was compromised in her career. Now, so there are real consequences of these Twitter storms, and um, in that particular case, you can see how badly uh, institutions do, uh, uh, behave uh, in order to protect themselves. Once the storm has happened, the, even the Royal Society, which has no right whatsoever to reprimand any of its fellows, um, it has to go public uh, with, a, with an act of dissociation. Uh, um, in my view, he should have sued the Royal Society uh, for, for defamation, but he didn't, because by then the poor man was uh, hiding under the table somewhere. <coughs> so, uh, in, we're, we're fairly clear about the need to protect our right of free speech in the sort of areas uh, that are of importance to us in public discussion. But we shouldn't uh, ignore the fact that there are different kinds of beliefs and different kinds of utterance, some of which uh, have a different standing from scientific utterances. Uh, we, we tend to distinguish, at least we ought to distinguish, beliefs that are protected in some way from beliefs that are open to discussion. All religions have made this distinction. Uh, and um, the concept of blasphemy has something to do with this. You know, there are certain things uh, that, in, uh, according to the religion, you cannot put in question. Or if you put them in question, you mustn't do so publicly. Because words have effects, uh, and we protect certain of our beliefs because we're worried about the social effect uh, of criticizing them. And this, I think, is a very relevant thing for us today. You know, you can criticise my belief that the earth is spherical, that carbon is an element, or that Shakespeare was not the Earl of Oxford, and I won't feel any uh, feel threatened by you. But if you criticise my belief that Christ died to redeem mankind, or, or that the Jews were, are, are the chosen people, or that uh, the prophet Muhammad was appointed by God, um, or if you laugh at these beliefs, then I feel something different. I don't just feel that you're wrong, 
So depending on where I stand in all the various religions, I might uh, feel uh, deeply hurt. I feel that, that, that uh, there's something antagonistic has been said. So you know, in these protected areas, uh, we, we think that uh, something more is at stake than just the truth or falsity of the belief in question. Uh, and um, what, what is that more that is in stake? Now, it's, a, it's true that even in scientific areas, people try to protect their beliefs. Uh, if you have followed the, dis, the, the disputes in American uh, education over whether, whether uh, evolution should be taught in, in schools, or whether if it is taught, um, intelligent design should be taught along with it as a, uh, as a, as a possible alternative. <coughs> You know, these disputes have become heated in just the way that religious disputes are. Some, uh, some of the scientific, uh, allegedly totem, purely scientific thinkers um, get hot under the collar when it comes to the uh, question of intelligent design, saying that, you know, thou shalt not teach that to children. <laughs> it, it is, uh, it is um, undermining uh, the, the, the manifest truth about the human condition and therefore disadvantaging them in, in the world to which they are destined. Now, um, <clears throat> of course, we know, uh, because Karl Popper has pointed it out so successfully, that, that the sign of a scientific belief is that it's open to refutation. Somebody who doesn't open his, uh, his beliefs to refutation is not thinking scientifically. That's the mark of a scientific belief. Therefore, the attempt to protect scientific beliefs removes them from the, from the realm of science and puts them in that other realm of the protective beliefs. But what is it that protective beliefs have in, in common? What distinguishes them? Obviously, religions have such beliefs at their heart, but even people without religion have protected beliefs. Uh, and uh, indeed, it's mostly people without religion who are responsible for the kind of censorship that Professor Foss referred to. Uh, people who are who are post-religious, uh, belong to a post-religious communities, but still have just as much need as any pious Muslim for the the things that cannot be questioned. Uh, it's just that the things that cannot be questioned have changed uh, and are apt to change from one week to the next. So, what is it about beliefs that causes people to protect them? I think the the principal thing is that they are a sign of membership. Uh, they are uh, they are identity forming beliefs. You you join a community by having these beliefs or by expressing them. You know uh, you belong with a particular uh, section of humanity and you would enjoy their protection too. So um, <coughs> when your self identity is wrapped up in a belief in that sense, your sense of who you are uh, is is also at risk when other people criticize the belief. And the criticize, criticizing my beliefs is an assault on me. Uh, and um, instead of judging our beliefs in terms of their truth or falsehood, we judge them in terms of whether they're mine or, or, or not mine. And it, but what happens when you take religion away? Uh, in effect, uh, you can take religion away from people, but you cannot destroy in them their desire for membership, their desire for, to be part of something that, that in some way uh, includes them and protects them and protects their, their thinking from adverse uh, encounters uh, around them. Uh, and people still need their, uh, they still need this sense of identity, even if they have no belief in God and no religious ceremony with which to rehearse it. They still claim it. In, uh, and this is essentially what has happened in our time, I think, that um, that we have uh, f found the emergence after the the, the uh, dwindling of Christian faith of of negative identities, uh, identity people make for themselves identities which are not built around what they are for, but what they're against, uh, and of this this phenomenon. Uh, uh, was uh, ro rose very much to, to the top of, uh, of the uh, European experience in the in the twentieth century, where uh, with with communism 
uh, and, and Nazism and so on, in, in which uh, new identities were on offer, uh, for which you could claim purely on the strength of what you hated. If you hated the Jews, you're, you're wrong, uh, 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 you know, a long way along the path of becoming a proper Nazi and enjoying the protection that it offered. Likewise, if you hated the bourgeoisie, uh, you got a long way uh, along that ad identity which was offered by the Communist Party. Now, all that those totalitarian ways of giving people identity uh, have vanished, more or less, from the, from the possibilities of able, available to people. But there are other negative uh, identities that are still clearly available, nevertheless. Uh, and um, this is essentially what we've seen emerging I in universities, uh, what, what one, one might call the, the victim identities. If you can claim identity with a victim group, whatever that group might be, claim its history of persecution as, uh, uh, as defining your p position, you've gained an enormous advantage in all the in the competition competition for scarce resources, especially in a in an in the academic world. You know, uh, we've seen this uh, obviously with feminism, which uh, has its roots in perfectly legitimate. Uh, uh, speculations from the Enlightenment onwards about the relation between men and women and the, their distinct roles in society uh, and the validity or otherwise of the way in which uh, 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 women have been treated. But in American universities from the 1960s onwards, uh, feminism, instead of becoming a, a form of uh, r rational reflection on the condition of women, became a negative identity. You joined the feminist movement by way of uh, identifying with women as victims, victims of men, of course. And, um, and then out of that negative identity, all kinds of beliefs uh, emerged. For example, the belief that, uh, that the family is a patriarchal organization in which men exert control over, uh, over women f in order to reproduce. They want them using women as slaves in order to generate children who will be uh, 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 advancing their their <coughs> their uh, social power and so on. Uh, those beliefs that emerged then out of the negative identity became beliefs which were protected. You couldn't question them, uh, and I think you will find in many American universities today courses of so-called gender studies, in which um, which are built around these protected beliefs which cannot be questions, be, uh, questioned, beliefs about the nature of men, what they do to women, and so on, uh, which um, are, the, are, are truths uh, which are, are, are immovable. So this um, invention of, of victim classes and then claiming uh, the membership of them, I think is an extremely important uh, tool in the hands of people who have don't have the support of a religion, but nevertheless need an identity. Uh, the victim identity is an identity which you can define against the surrounding order. You're standing up for the oppressed against all these comfortable people who have taken all the rewards against uh, all the re rewards from you, uh, and uh, you, you are entitled, therefore, to move aggressively against your surroundings. You're, you know, it's, it's not for your own sake you're doing this. It's for the sake of um, of women or, or gays or now it's transsexuals it's um, whatever it might be the, the cause of the moment uh, so you, you can justify your indignation in this way uh, without actually paying the cost of it because after all you've never yourself been a victim, you're a, uh, a well um, funded middle member of the middle classes with a free education in a university and all the, all the rest. Uh, but nevertheless, you can claim an advantage over the people um, <coughs> competing with you for the rewards of the academic life uh, by uh, identifying uh, in this way with the victims. Now, all, as I say, all, all human beings need identities, an identity in that sense. Um, living as a pure individual according to open, uh, uh, enlightenment standards of rational thought, putting every matter to the question, this is jolly hard. Um, that's what we think a university is for, of course, that very that hard work, uh, hard form of life in which you put everything uh, to the test of, uh, of critical argument. But um, 
uh, it's not something that m most of us are capable of. So, um, and certainly not the mass of the students who enter a, a university uh, in that fragile uh, period of life when you are looking for an identity of your own. So uh, it's not surprising that these negative identities flourish on university campuses, in particular among uh, students who have um, nothing, uh, uh, who, who want nothing when they come there, nothing materially, except something like this. So, um, what, what, ha why does this lead, though, to, to this assault on free speech everywhere? I think the crucial matter to grasp is that when it comes to a protected belief, it's not the falsehood of what the other person says that upsets you, uh, it's the truth. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's only truth, therefore, that is censored. But you, we see this, in, you know, in obviously in the, the famous case of the church and Galileo. You know, he, he, Galileo wouldn't have mattered at all to the church had he been uh, pouring out obvious falsehoods about the heavens uh, and the relation of the sun to them and so on, uh, to the earth. But um, it's because he was saying true things that he had to be shut up. Likewise, uh, you know, an, anybody who, who raises in an objective, f uh, philological frame of mind uh, the question of the origin of the Quran, you know, he has to be shut up because the truth about it is incompatible with all kinds of things upon which build, people have built a way of life. Likewise, with, um, <clears throat> with the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century that shut up all their critics, uh, what their critics were saying was um, uh, objectionable because of its truth. And so if you build your life on a falsehood, you must fight to the death against the truth. And I think this is what uh, we see, even with these little negative um, <coughs> uh, victim identities that I've been referring to, that there is a fight to the death about those things upon which identities have been built. Uh, and there is a real, real question for our civilization as to whether we can live with the open enlightenment frame of mind that doesn't allow these fights to the death which says you know um, that's your problem uh, 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 if you if you feel that about this belief and learns to, uh, to, to laugh at it so um, we experience the same need as I say for identity forming beliefs and when we find them we protect them uh, but uh, the question is what what uh, what how how are they protected and is there a, a way of undoing the protection so that we can expose some of these beliefs to critical argument and at least not suffer the cost of um, <laughs> of being censored and outcast uh, and even violently attacked for our critic for our raising the question of them now that I think we need to look back over the recent 20 or 30 years of history and the rise of political correctness in this context. Political correctness is obviously uh, a way of, uh, of uh, attacking communities on behalf of uh, potential victim classes. And it has gone hand in hand with radical censorship. Uh, first of all, the, the invention of isms and phobias. You know, this is a, a very uh, significant thing that has happened in my right lifetime. It began with the invention of the concept of racism. Uh, now, we, we all know that there is such a thing as believing that, given, that a, a given race or community of human beings has properties different from another one and maybe is superior to the other one and maybe uh, justifies, therefore, the, for the, the, the superior race taking over. We all know from the history of colonialism that there are uh, forms of ways of thinking about uh, other sections of humanity that are demeaning of them and that we ought not to um, uh, in in indulge in. And so that there is something, you know, it's a real historical f truth that we're referring to, including, obviously, the truth of slavery, uh, and the more brutal forms of colonialism. But uh, when the wor word racist became a standard accusation uh, of, uh, against people in superior positions in our society, it wasn't that that was being criticized. 
You know, that was long in the past, all that. What was being criticised was usually uh, uh, some uh, a word that had been used wrongly, some uh, the revelation of an of an attitude that could be, when uh, when properly examined, regarded as a, a heresy. It was a it was a genuine witch hunt, uh, which was which uh, involved penalising people for having raised questions, even. Uh, uh, Professor Foss referred to the Honeyford case that I was involved in, in, in my country, where a mild-mannered, ma- gentle, but patriotic headmaster raised the question as to whether we were uh, treating our immigrant communities rightly uh, by regarding their culture as untouchable. Shouldn't we be in our school introducing their children to the culture here that they're destined to be in, rather than letting it letting them absorb uh, beliefs and uh, and customs, which quite frankly we regard as um, uh, uh, as unacceptable. I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask, but that was racism. It was racism because it was making a distinction, which had adverse ref- um, implications for the uh, the society that he was uh, r- uh, writing about. But these ism once racism got going, all sorts of other isms and phobias got came in the wake of it. I mean, just to take the, 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 um, the uh, c- case of, of, um, of Islamophobia. This, uh, um, th- this extraordinary uh, mental disease r- occurred suddenly in the whole of the Western world uh, uh, in, on September the, um, the 10th in 2001. I was saying September the 11th in uh, 2001. Suddenly, it was there; hadn't been there before, um, uh, and it, you know we have to ask ourselves why did this this disease suddenly appear, and why were we all guilty of it? it of course, because it it, it it served a very useful purpose, which was to prevent open and free discussion of what had happened on that day, and what it was about Islam, if anything, which uh, motivated people to act in that way. So. Uh, since then, we've had uh, lots of other isms and phobias, uh, uh, and you've had them here in Denmark too. Um, in fact, s- Scandinavian people uh, are, are uh, even more quick than, than Anglo-Saxons to, to pick this up. Uh, you know, uh, homophobia is, a, is a, uh, a mental crime here, just as it is in my country. Uh, it's just that you don't know what, <coughs> how to commit it. You know, uh, because uh, uh, if you just, as we had to, uh, open discussion about whether there should be uh, gay marriage in our country, it was it was never explained to us at the time when we began this discussion that if you took uh, one side of it, you that that accused you automatically of homophobia. You know, um, so it's clear that you can fall in, you can fall into that crime, uh, just like that, because the definition is constantly. Uh, shifting. I, I was brought up I- in Cambridge University in the post-war period, in which um, uh, 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 it was perfectly normal, of course, to uh, uh, that people engaged in that sort of activity. I, I was um, ju- I, I was judged adversely because I, I differed from the surroundings in three important respects. I, I was um, lower class, le- uh, right wing and heterosexual, uh, and the, that combination uh, in Cambridge of my day was regarded as so vulgar that I was uh, almost outside the reach of polite discourse. But nevertheless, nobody would have st- uh, thought that this was grounds for censoring what I had to say when we discussed these <coughs> issues. Of course not. Um, it was all part of, of, of the surrounding world. It was only... It was only much later that suddenly it became impossible to discuss this, the issue of homosexuality without committing this undefined crime. You know, um, nobody knows wh- when the word phobia is used. No, uh, nobody is, respects its, its ancient Greek meaning, you know, which means fear. Uh, 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 it's, it means it's come to mean now irrational hatred of somebody on, on some particular grounds. Uh, um, something which, had I had that irrational hatred uh, uh, as a young man, I'd have had no friends. <laughs> uh, and it's still true today, I guess. Um, so th- this um, invention of labels, 
it is a very important part of, of political correctness. Uh, and uh, it's part of a more general uh, uh, a custom, which is that of, of, of controlling the speech of, around a particular issue. If, if, you, if we can control the speech around that issue, it becomes impossible to have more than one view of it. Uh, and George Orwell uh, anticipated this very brilliantly in his famous novel 1984, which I'm sure most of you know, uh, when he invented the idea of newspeak, that the party uh, controlling the uh, the society of that imagined uh, uh, totalitarian state uh, invented a language in which only the things acceptable to the party could be could be expressed. There wasn't any, any room for disagreement anymore because Newspeak um, simply er erased the words used that, that might be used to express disagreement. And I think that, that's to some extent what we're seeing in political correctness, taking, taking away the words that we might use in order to express disagreement. Uh, you know, in the case of, of homosexuality, obviously, that word has been taken away. Uh, you, know, you have to use a word like gay uh, uh, instead. Uh, and um, I I again, in the discussion of, uh, of <coughs> relations with the Islamic world, the language is very carefully controlled. There are things that you cannot say and things that you can't say. And uh, 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 we've had a recent example of this, uh, that uh, the, the language is constantly changing in order to prevent new things being said. Uh, this is the case of Germaine Greer, who, who came to speak in one of our universities. Now, she was uh, one of the original radical feminists who believed that, um, uh, that men really are oppressive, that, that uh, women as a sex have lived under the thumb of, uh, of the other sex, the, the, um, uh, the unfair sex, which is mine, and, uh, and that she has made her life out of propagandizing this and showing the extent to which uh, the, the, ma the male is assumed as the dominant cultural figure in, in our literature and painting and music and so on. And, and, and of course she has cast an awful lot of light on our literary tradition in this way. I mean she's very much respected uh, of course as a, an outspoken uh, literary figure. But she giving a, 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 a university lecture at some point on this um, touched on the transgender issue uh, and, and, and didn't realize that, that, that she should be using the word gender and not the word sex. Uh, and she said that uh, men are of one sex and women of another sex and the fact that a man thinks that he's a woman doesn't mean he's of the, of the female sex. Um, she, uh, has she uh, um, uh, used her, the correct language and said that you know, the fact that he thinks he's of the uh, female gender means that he is of the female gender, that would have been all right. But she fell off uh, the, um, the edge of the, uh, 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 of the permitted <coughs> forms of expression and used the word sex properly uh, and, of course, exposed what was uh, lurking behind the word gender, namely the desire to make everything a matter of choice, to spread freedom into all the areas where freedom is impossible. Uh, and so uh, she ex unwittingly exposed the lie behind a, a new uh, version of the uh, sexual war. And uh, uh, as a result, she became the la latest target for uh, uh, censorship. She, uh, no platform can be can be offered to her because she's uh, um, shown uh, this disrespect for the possibility of transgender identity. She is guilty of transphobia, um, <laughs> and that, that that word is now in the vocabulary. Uh, and and um, <coughs> you you might uh, we'll have to see just what its subsequent history will be. But anyway. Uh, uh, one thing that has been achieved by that particular movement, the, fe the radical feminist movement uh, in uh, our um, universities, is in effect to uh, get rid of the word sex. Because sex refers to a, a biological fact, which we can't deny, um, it interferes with the, the freedom and the aspirations of those people who want to deny it. It's created a new victim class, the class of the people who can't stand the truth about Biology, uh, human biology. So it has been replaced by the word gender. 
And now you will see on all official forms, you know, the word sex doesn't appear. Uh, in my passport, I'm of male gender. Uh, insofar as I've ever thought about what gender I am, I have thought, well, you know, it would be nice to be fem more feminine than I am. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that does seem like something that you can choose. But uh, as for my sex, no. So this, uh, here is a way in which uh, total obscurity has entered into a, a, an issue which is of vital importance to all human beings, which is sexual identity, by confiscating the very word with which it could be expressed, the word sex. Uh, so um, we have got to a very strange uh, position with this, um, uh, th th this kind of political correctness, and there's a real question of what we might do about it. I think P Professor Foss has, has touched on this, uh, and um, I, I will just say a few words in conclusion. We, we all recognize that, the, uh, as I said at the beginning, that it's morally wrong to give gratuitous offense to people. You know, we can't say that, that, you, that, that we're within our moral rights if we insult people or laugh at their religion or whatever it might be. But the point is not about morality, it's about legality. We can't. We still need a legal order in which people are free to do that if we are to explore the possibilities available to us and also if we are to resolve our, our conflicts. You know, many of our conflicts today are about protected beliefs. They are about uh, people wanting to stop discussion of issues. Uh, and uh, we are living in a society where there are issues arising which really must be discussed. Um, in particular, of course, the religion, uh, the, the, the uh, contest between Islamic and, and Christian or post-Christian worldviews. It has got to be discussed, otherwise we won't know where we are or how to incorporate uh, new communities, how to reconcile ourselves to their way of life and so on. But uh, at the moment, we're in a position of ossified silence <coughs> about this matter of such importance to us. Uh, so, although we, it's morally wrong to, to give offence, it should be legally permissible. On the other hand, uh, there's a further problem, and, and as Professor Foss r r remarked, there's a, a new kind of uh, person emerging who's expert in taking offence. In fact, uh, gender studies in our universities is a kind of uh, three-year concentrated discipline in taking offence. Uh, uh, and uh, whatever you say, uh, somebody will, um, will step in and accuse you of this. Uh, and the Hunt case is just one example. Uh, and I think we're all, we will see more and more examples of this kind. Uh, so we, we have to recognise uh, that we are in a society where people are es essentially taking offence for a, for a purpose. Uh, you know, the, it's the cost-free way of gaining superiority over your um, interlocutor. If you can say, ah, you, what you said has offended me, I'm offended as a woman, a gay, or whatever I might choose to identify myself as. Uh, you've, you've got the upper hand without paying the... The, the genuine cost of that, which is having a good argument. And uh, so uh, this is a really serious assault on, our, on, on rationality in public discourse. And the answer to it, as I see it, is, is not to be intimidated uh, and to laugh at the person who takes offence. We, we do have to cultivate the sense of humour. Um, th it, it's the, uh, this is the thing that, that, that eventually cured us of Puritanism. You know, in, the, in the 17th century, laughter was very difficult in Britain, even more difficult in Massachusetts, uh, but gradually people learned to laugh at it. You know, Butler's famous poem, Hudibras, which, which mocked the, um, the Puritans of 17th century England, did us a tremendous amount of good. Uh, and gradually American literature learned to laugh at this. Uh, uh, and um, I think that that, that tradition of satire is, is a, a precious achievement of our civilization. And it, but it's interesting that it's precisely our disposition to laugh at the absurdities of radical Islam, which is now being silenced by everyone, or by, well, by them, and by the politically correct on behalf of them. So this is where the fight begins, uh, and I have, uh, all I can say is that prominent among those who fought this fight is, of course, the Free Speech Society here, 
which uh, has suffered for it, uh, and but nevertheless is setting an example to us all. Uh, and um, I, I guess this is the point where I should end because uh, I, I, I've looked through my repertoire of jokes for one that can be told that would be suitable to end on, and I couldn't find one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the matter is far too serious. Thank you.